Stu, I've been asking some of my friends, uh, mainly physicists, mathematicians, about Wigner's famous phrase about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Uh, you, also my friend, uh, my theoretical biologist who've used mathematics for decades, uh, ha ha have told me about the uselessness of mathematics, particularly in analyzing the biosphere and evolution. So yes. uh, you're, uh, as usual, a contrarian, and here I am <laughs> to learn. So. Wigner cast upon the world this amazing phrase, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, and it's spectacular in physics. We have the standard model now. The question is whether or not we should be overwhelmed by his claim, and I think the answer is yes, but absolutely no. So if we think about the evolution of the biosphere, of biology, I, I, I am now falling in love with the phrase, the reasonable uselessness <laughs> of mathematics. And it's true, and I will tell you, I wrote about a year ago, I wrote something called The Surprising True Story of Patrick, Rupert, Sly, and Gus protocells in their very early life at the start of life. So we want to picture a, a, a warm little pond, Darwin's warm little pond, and there's a lot of protocells bouncing around. Uh, so Patrick's a protocell. They're all Gen X or protocells. They're just ordinary protocells. One day what happens to Patrick is that he, he, he well, there's slowly flowing stuff in, in, the, in, in, in the lagoon, and all the protocells eat the stuff. One day, Patrick feels a hurt in his side, and he says, oh, what's that? And a, a peptide sticks out, and it gets stuck to a rock. Well, Patrick's miserable because he's stuck to a rock. He doesn't want to be stuck to a rock. And he, he wants to get back to the pun, and he wants to eat stuff, but he can't move because he's stuck, and he, try, and he can't. Then you know what happens to Patrick? Well, the, the solely moving stuff is flowing in the pond, and because he's stuck in one spot, he looks around and stuff is rushing at him from left and right and up and down faster than he's ever seen it before, and he eats more than he's ever see, had before, as so we divide sooner, and pretty soon there's lots of Patrick stuck to rocks, and that's why Patrick is Patrick the First. He's Patrick the First filter feeder. He's the first filter feeder in the whole universe. And then Rupert comes along and so on. Now the point of this is, and this is roughly speaking true, um, Patrick has just become something new. A new function has emerged in the biosphere, being a filter feeder. Um, but you could write down no mathematics for the becoming of Patrick as a filter feeder. What would you write down? What equation would you write? Then Patrick stuck to the rock, and Rupert, who is a little un unusual, he can already poke holes in, in, in other protocells and eat them. And he finds himself in the Patrick patch, and he's just miserable. But then, then he finds that he can, he can poke a hole in Patrick and eat Patrick or the Patricks that are around. And then he evolves so that he's only living uh, in Patrick patches. So he's become the first predator in the universe. Uh, uh, what mathematics would you write down for, for Rupert managing to become somebody who can eat Patricks? You can't. You can write down the dynamics once they exist and make an ecosystem out of it. And the entire evolution of the biosphere is this, in which new things, new functions, new creatures come into existence that make livings with one another in ever different ways, like we're making livings right now, talking to one another. Could you have written down an equation uh, for the becoming of all of these ways of making a living in, uh, in the bathroom? The, the answer is no, there's no mathematics for it. Well, theoretically, I, it, one would say, if you knew how to describe every single particle and all their dimensions, and and the, and the quantum probabilities, it, it seems impossibly large, but in, it, it, it is finite, and you, you could do that. No. Uh, okay, so that's the fundamental no, but, thing. But, yeah, but here's why. In principle. Sure. You're saying in principle you can't. Yeah, and here's why. So, so let's say, let's try that move. Let's make it a classical world. Forget quantum mechanics. From us out to the sun is just a, you know, it's a huge 6 n-dimensional phase space. Okay, so it's a really big one. How would you pick out as relevant variables uh, Patrick being stuck to a rock? There is no way to specify the collective degrees of freedom that are relevant to the becoming of the biosphere. None. So of course it's a six dimensional classical phase space, or it's a whatever it is, you know, in Hilbert space. You, you can't get to the, 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 the relevant variables that have to do with the evolution of the biosphere. So, so, so your claim is, is that when new 
functions appear. Mm -hmm. They are uh, not being able to be described by pre-stated laws or, mathema or mathematical descriptions. But once they do appear, then mathematical descriptions of their dynamics, how they sure. interact, are perfectly yeah. fine. Yeah. So but it's you, that origin moment. It's the that, origin moment of every new functionalities in the becoming of okay. the biosphere. Okay. We do need to defend the word function, uh, which we might want to take a moment and do. You can. I do it in my last book, uh, whatever I call it, <laughs> World Beyond Physics, <laughs> that just came out. So depending, so once you can defend the word function, which I will in a moment, ever new functions arise in the evolution of the biosphere. They arise in the evolution of the economy. Uh, there were not cell phones a thousand years ago, and people did pretty well. Once there's cell phones, there's apps on cell phones. What is actual now enables the adjacent possible of what can become. Yeah. You cannot restate it. We are sucked into the opportunities we ourselves unknowingly create, and so is the biosphere. So it's an entirely new way of thinking about about the becoming of things. I, I follow that. It's just that I'm I'm struggling between is that is that true in principle, and or is it true because it is it it is so large it's it's uncomputable. I think it's true in principle. And I'll come back to the way Longo and Monteville and I did. It has to do with pre-stating. To write down laws of motion, you have to be able to say what the relevant variables are. So think of the pendulum. Uh, it was really very, very smart to figure out that it's the length of the pendulum and the mass of the pendulum that give you a phase space that gives you a periodic oscillation of the kind that Galileo drove us to when he noticed that the swinging pendulum in church uh, kept the same period no matter what the amplitude was. But you need to know the relevant variables. Newton tells us mass, and he tells us, you know, mass and, and velocity and acceleration and momentum and his laws of motion. What variables would you write down, you know, about the becoming of, of, of grizzly bears? What? What would you write down? You can't. I, I hear you, but I, I'm not sure that you're embedding all the super complexity that leads to the the uh, random mutations that that build things what that create mean? things what do you mean i don't understand well i i, I mean if, if you how does how, how do new functions happen at all how do they happen they happen because uh, a photon or cosmic ray from uh, from andromeda a uh, supernova Andromeda mean, hits uh, hits a genetic uh, yeah, so and changes you, a, a, a gene. You mean our, our, and, and then that uh, something and then you mean something causal happens and new functions emerge. Yes. Yeah, of course that's true. Right. Uh, but the but question is, could you predict that ultimately with some super equation of the universe? I mean, it, it's impractical, of course. But the question is, the fundamental question is, is it is it is it uh, untrue in principle, which your which is your claim? I think my claim is the following. Uh, this is Giuseppe and I and, and Mile. Um, let me describe affordances. So I can't remember who came up with the notion of affordances. It's perfectly well known. An affordance is um, this, table, this table affords a surface on which we can put cups. These chairs afford a surface on which we can sit. Is there a finite list of all possible affordances of things for uses to do stuff? No, there's just not. It's like the uses of screwdrivers and the indefiniteness of the uses of screwdrivers. You cannot prestate all okay. the uses of screwdrivers. You cannot prestate all possible tasks. It, it, the question of what's all possible tasks doesn't make sense. There's no list of it. Yet new tasks, uh, new functions, and so on come to exist always causally, or they're, they're quantum mutations. So if quantum mutations are acausal, non-causally. So uh, to take again the example of a, we'll take the example of a fruit fly, where a mutation that's a quantum event mutates the DNA and changes a C to a G, and let it be a dominant mutation. So that's quantum mechanics. Now the DNA molecule is more or less classical. The fly is certainly classical. And now it has a white eye, not a red eye. The white eye happens to be fitter in the environment. Uh, the consequence of which is that the the white-eyed fly, since it's dominant, spreads its DNA within 20 years, so there's millions of copies of that DNA in the universe. How come? Quantum mechanics doesn't explain it. Classical mechanics doesn't explain it. You need the notion of the fitness of the fly in its world. The white-eyed fly 
is might have been a new function, and now it's selected, but there's no law for that selection. There's no law for that becoming in the biosphere. So there's no law for the becoming in the universe of this, this strange molecule and this strange organism in the non-ergodic universe above the level of atoms, where almost none of the complex things that could exist will ever exist.